Have you been blessed this morning? I hope so. I hope you've been blessed this morning. It's been a good morning. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to go ahead and continue my series, A Christmas Foretold. This week I'm going to be talking about a light in the darkness. And once again, I'm going to take from the Old Testament and read a passage of Scripture there. And I'm not necessarily going to be talking about the usual uh, scripture that's pulled out of this passage. It's going to be topical, so pray for me. Um, I've been doing that a lot lately, but it's all right. I think, uh, I think there's a great message here and something awesome to think about at this time. <clears throat> What's interesting about Christmas time is this, uh, this idea of foretelling, this idea of prophecy, of, of getting ready for something that was spoken about so long ago. And even in our uh, traditions here in America and uh, around the world, there is one in particular that many people go all out in. They, they spend so much energy and so much time and so many resources and, and daily resources and electric bills go through the roof uh, because of this, but it's the lights at Christmas time. The lights always come uh, before Christmas, traditionally. And there might be some of you who are throwing up your Christmas tree on the very last minute on Christmas Eve before your family shows up maybe, but traditionally and typically most people are putting up their Christmas lights uh, at the beginning of the month or uh, the weekend after Thanksgiving. I know that, that in our family that it was, it's typically the tradition is, is that weekend after Thanksgiving is when we decorate for Christmas. It's when the Christmas music starts. And that too is something that happens before Christmas gets here. There is, there, Christmas is being foretold. It's being uh, anticipated. We light the Advent candles in anticipation of the day that we celebrate Christ's birth. Now, uh, regardless of what we believe or what you may believe about the exact date of birth, birth, uh, the birth of Christ is irrelevant. Uh, December 25th, I don't think, is hailed as the exact date that Christ was born. It is just the exact day that we celebrate it. That's what's important, is that we've set aside a day holy unto him, that this is the day we celebrate his birth. And, and what's funny is that as the lights go up and as the music begins to play, we celebrate his birth the entire month. Amen. And we ought to be celebrating his birth and his life all year long. But it's interesting to me seeing these different lights that shine. And they shine so bright, especially in the darkness. Now for me, when we plug in our Christmas tree during the day and we've got all that daylight flooding in, it looks nice. But it's not near as lovely as when the sun goes down and it's dark and our living room has shadows in it, and then you plug that Christmas tree in and it lights up, and it just looks so beautiful and it's so brilliant. There's something about lights that shine in darkness. Here in Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah prophesies of such a light. Starting there in verse 1, he says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder for as in the day of Midian's defeat you have shattered the yoke that burdens them the bar across their shoulders the rod of their oppressor every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning and will be fuel for the fire for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is God's word. And may the Lord God 
add his blessing to the reading of his word. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for light. I thank you that you cause us to see. I thank you for your wisdom and your light. I thank you for the light of hope and joy that we see in Christ through your mercy and your grace. Lord, give us light today. I pray that we do not stumble in the darkness, but that we would have the light of life. Guide our feet. Show us the path in front of us. Be our lamp. Father, guard my mouth and guard our hearts. I pray that which is not of you be forgotten, that which is not of you be cast down. I pray that all imaginations and knowledge that exalts itself against you, Lord God Almighty, that you would show yourself victorious over all the foolishness of this world. Give us wisdom. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And here in verse 2 of this particular passage, well, let me, let me back up. Verse 6 and 7, um, I guess I'm moving forward, not backing up. But in 6 and 7, you have this prophecy of a son being given to us, of a child being born, and his name that is named. What's interesting is earlier in this passage, uh, there is a prophecy given in verse uh, number two, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned, or in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. It comes on the heel of Isaiah saying, he will an- honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan there in verse one. This prophecy, and, and, and even as I'm talking about it, and I'm saying, you know, let me step forward or move backwards, and I'm moving forward in the verse and moving backward in the verse, you find that there's a fulfillment of this prophecy that, it, that follows this same pattern of being out of order of when it was written and the time that it was in. If you look in Matthew chapter 4, <clears throat> turn there with me real quick. Let's see the fulfillment of this verse. In Christ Jesus, we have Matthew chapter 4. Around verse 16, Matthew 4. Actually, let me, uh, let me back up. For, start there in verse 12. <clears throat> Matthew 4. It says, When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. To fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Here you have the prophecy which comes before a child being given to us, happening and being fulfilled later in the life of Christ when he is a full-grown man. Well, the point is, I, I don't think the matter of time or the span of time is important, that it's maybe mixed up, that one verse comes before the other, and that this is fulfilled after his birth, and all that. It's just that it's the life of Christ that it is pointing to, which is important. Um, this verse with unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given, Matthew does not quote. I think it's obvious. I think it's obvious when you read that passage and you think about the son being given and the government being on upon his shoulders that it is implied that it is a speaking of Jesus Christ. But I find it interesting that Matthew, the Hebrew, the one who comes from a law mentality, a Moses and the prophets mentality when he writes his gospel, more than any other gospel, Matthew, in this gospel, you have more Old Testament scripture quoted than any other gospel. It also is the first gospel coming out of the Old Testament. So the transition is actually made perfectly in this book, in this collection of books we call the Bible. But Matthew does not quote the son being given or the child being born or the government being upon his shoulders. He says that 
Those living in darkness saw a great light. Those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And he names specifically the region in which they live. In the land of Zebulun, Naphtali, along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. It's amazing to me. And right as he quotes this and says it's a fulfillment, in verse 17, pay attention to this, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. I believe that the kingdom of heaven uh, being preached through this prophecy of light can be found throughout the entire scripture. This is where I will deviate and begin to preach topically. I'm going to talk about light. Light's interesting. Light is very, very interesting. There are some uh, people that have um, qualms and arguments with scientists and those who like science. And there are those even today that are saying that science and uh, biblical truth are not compatible. That uh, God and, amen, that God... God and, the, and science do not uh, agree on some things. Well, I find it interesting. You know, God created light first, and some scientists, they will tell you, science will tell you that if it were not the light from the sun hitting earth, that all life on earth would perish. The Bible says the exact same thing. That if it were not for the light of the sun, there would be no life in this world. John chapter 1 says, and that light was the life Mm, mm. The life of all men that come into this world, John chapter 1. Anyways, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1 it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. Interesting, the way that it's worded in this poem, this ancient poem in the books of Moses. Moses. That God said, let there be light, and there was light. It was the first thing that he creates, um, or not necessarily the first thing that he creates, but it was the first thing created on the first day, mentioned in Scripture. God saw that the light was good. And so he separated the light from the darkness. It's an interesting thing about light is that it gives separation between things. When you have light, there is the ability to discern and to tell the difference from things, that there is a separation that happens under the light. If you were trying to work under the hood of your car, maybe, and you were looking there and it was dim in your garage, and you're trying to find the right wire or the right hose, it's hard to see without any light, so you place a light in there and you're able to separate and discern between which is the right hose or the wire or whatever it is that you're looking at. You're able to see more clearly God creates light first. And I believe that from the beginning when God said, let there be light, that that continues to echo throughout the ages that in Christ Jesus we see that same light, that God is not finished showing light into the world. God's law is light. Now, the scripture is full. The scripture is full of these different things that point to light. But I want to uh, encourage you that through all these scriptures that I'm going to read, that through all the Old Testament and all through the New Testament, everything is pointing to Jesus Christ. Even these scriptures about the light, this idea of light being preeminent, being on the first day, is indicative of Christ being eminent, that he is first and to be foremost. God's law is light. Jesus Christ is the word of God. Jesus Christ is the logos. God's law is light. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23 says, For this command is a lamp. This teaching is a light. And correction and instruction are the way to life. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This this law, this word from God is described as being light. The commands of God, the precepts of God are, are spoken about as being light. Spoken about as being wisdom and light, and even those who are wise, shining is light. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, another prophet Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That those who are wise shine. That there is a light that is coming from wisdom. There is a light that comes from the wise themselves, those who possess wisdom. And it brings us to 
brings us to the prophecies being fulfilled through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This time at Christmas, we think about all those different things in our nativity scene, and one that is uh, uh, very familiar and, and seen in a lot of nativities in the manger is the three wise men. Now, the scripture speaks specifically about three separate gifts, but it speaks plural of wise men, not giving a specific number, but we use three, uh, representing those three gifts uh, that were given by the wise men to Jesus. I believe that there was probably an entire entourage and an armed guard that was going with these men simply because of the way that they spoke to the king. I don't think that people would have spoken to the king unless they had some sort of protection the way that they spoke to him, talking about a different king being born. That's neither here nor there. In Matthew chapter 2, turn with me real quick. We're going to look at some more scripture. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. I want you to pay close attention to how many times the star is mentioned in this particular passage that Matthew thought it necessary to to point this out. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Notice that he found out that time, not when the baby was born. But he found out the exact time that the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star... They were overjoyed. Interesting. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Interesting there in verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. This, this, this to me, I think, is, is an encouragement that the church ought to jump on board with, that when you begin to see the light that God is guiding you with, that you ought to already be filled with joy. There are so many people that are waiting until they see the sun that, that they don't even rejoice over the light that they've been given. Mm, I'm talking to somebody. <sighs> There are too many people that just have this grim look on their face and they, they're no, there's no joy in their life. There's no peace in their life. They know about Jesus Christ. They've been given light. They've been, there has been a star, so to speak. There's been a light that's been shining, guiding them to Christ, though they haven't seen Christ in the flesh. But there's no joy. These men had not seen the child yet, but they were overjoyed when they saw the star because they knew where it was pointing to. What's interesting is that they saw the star and they were overjoyed, but they did not worship the star. It says that when they came into the house and they saw the child, they bowed down and they worshipped him. There are some people that worship the light that they're given. There are some people that are so caught up. I've seen them and you see them maybe in some of these mega churches and big uh, places that have these awesome teachers. And I'm not trying to discredit them or say anything bad about them. But there are those that like to lay claim to their teacher's teaching and the light that they've been giving rather than Christ himself. Hmm. There are those that choose to shine their own light. There are those that are more content with artificial light rather than real light. You might know some Jehovah's Witnesses. 
And I got to give them credit for their hard work in trying to go door to door and tell people about the gospel that they preach. But the problem is with Jehovah's Witnesses is they are more concerned with spreading their artificial light than they are with real light. Do you ever wonder why kingdom halls don't have windows? They would rather stay in artificial light than have real light shine on them. I'm not trying to make accusations, but as a preacher of the gospel, I must tell you, if you study this scripture and you look at the publications that Watchtower Magazine puts out, they do not agree with the scripture. And we need to expose darkness wherever it is at. Maybe you have some Jehovah's Witnesses friends. Pray for them. I only bring this up because I'd had a few that came to my door recently. And what I think, and I want to encourage you as Christians, if you have Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door, step outside with them. And John specifically talks about inviting people into the house that don't acknowledge Christ for who he really is. But they wanted to have a debate with me about the divinity of the Son of God. And I took a page out of Stephen Colbert's book, and I said, well, you say that Jesus is not God, that he's just the Son of God. Well, isn't the son of a duck a duck? And I got that look. That knowing look. So yes, the scripture calls him the son of God. It calls us sons of God also. But it holds this title in reverence for the son that was given. The one that Isaiah prophesies about saying that he is the mighty God. I cannot agree with any organization that wants to say Jesus is not God when the scripture clearly says that he is the mighty God, the everlasting Father. (sighs) Let scripture speak. Back to my point. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They went in and they worshiped Christ. If your light, if your light, your truth, is not leading you to the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, I dare say that your light might not be God's light. God's light points to Jesus Christ. It is all about Christ. All of it is about Christ. This season that we are in, Jesus is the reason for the season. They fell down and worshipped him, and you ought not to worship a man. If he was just a mere man, and that was all that he was, worshipping him would be blasphemy. But they bowed down and worshipped him showing who he was in his divinity, the Son of God, divine, who had become flesh. Amen. Christ is the light. Christ is the light. He's spoken about as light in several different places. Luke chapter 2. Let's go there real quick. I got lots of scriptures. I don't, I don't have a lot of notes. I got lots of scriptures and some half-baked ideas about what I think about it. I don't know. Um, I I don't want to bore you. I don't want to uh, wear out this idea of the light that you hear about light so much and I talk about stars and lights and lights shining that you get bored with light. My goal is actually that every time you see a light for this next week, every time you see a Christmas light, a stop light, a house light, a closet light, you think of Jesus Christ. That's my prayer for you. Because all lights point to him. All things point to him. Jesus Christ is the light. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse uh, 25. Now there was a man. Excuse me. Yes. His name was Simeon. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Notice this. The Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. And remember, this is before Christ has been crucified. This is before Acts chapter 2 in the day of Pentecost. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Verse 27. Moved by the Spirit. Not only was the Spirit on him, but that and he had light and revelation from the Spirit, but the Spirit moved him. He was led by the Spirit. He went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you you now can dismiss your servant in peace. 
For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There are things in this particular passage that are repeated thrice in three times. You have this trinity that shows up three times in this particular passage. When it speaks of Simeon, that he had the Holy Spirit and that the Spirit had revealed to him and that he was moved by the Spirit. The Spirit mentioned three specific times, but also in this passage you have three uh, mentions of a Greek word that is translated revelation or reveal. Three revelations are given. It's revealed to Simeon first that he will see the Christ. And then he says that the Christ himself, this child, has been prepared and is a light for revelation. And then he says to the mother that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Now in this structure of literature in Luke, Luke being a doctor, Luke not being a a, a dumb person. He's not an uneducated person. Some people don't like that word dumb. But he was not an uneducated person. He was in tune with the Holy Spirit. I believe that is why God used Luke to author this uh, gospel and to preach it. But Luke was precise. Luke, as a doctor, would have precision when he's thinking in his intellect and in his mind and when he's sharing that truth he uses particular details specifically with precision three times mentioning the holy spirit's influence on simeon three times mentioning mentioning revelation to simeon in the person of christ and to his mother in the revelation of people's hearts himself personally the christ messianically the messi the, the messiah and then globally for all peoples, revelation given. This usage of light, being Christ being the light, the spirit that was on him was the spirit of Christ according to Paul, Romans chapter eight. It is the spirit of Christ that indwells believers. It is the spirit of Christ that moves believers. It is the spirit of Christ that is guiding the children of God. And it is the spirit that brings conviction according to Jesus in John chapter 14 I believe it is that when the spirit comes he'll convict the world of sin righteousness and judgment that the thoughts and intents of the heart being revealed is a work of the Holy Spirit that this light of revelation through Jesus Christ is what gives this do you see that I pray that when you think of the Holy Spirit, when you think of revelation, you think of the light of Christ. You think of the Spirit giving light. We use that uh, metaphor all the time, shedding light on the subject. When you say you're shedding light on the subject, it means that you're bringing out knowledge. That things that were not known before are now known. It's a revelation. Christ is that light. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. Hmm. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Some versions say that the darkness has not overpowered it, has not overcome it. Nevertheless, the light shines in darkness. John understood that this word, the logos, the idea, the thoughts, intents, and purposes of God, the word, God's innermost being and who he is expressed the word. That's what words are. That's why we speak and we use words. We're communicating the thoughts and intents and purposes and ideas which are within ourselves, in our bosom, so to speak. Just as Jesus talks about the Son being in the bosom of the Father, being in his heart, in his inmost being. He is the light. And this light 
is the light of all mankind, the light of all men, and he shines in darkness. John had an awesome revelation. Through his gospel, he shares that, but also in the book of Revelation that he writes to the seven churches in Asia Minor, he shows also a revelation of who Jesus Christ is and who the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world is. He says of him in Revelation chapter 21, Verse 22, he says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp that the very light from the, for the people of God is the glory of God and the Lamb himself. Paul says it this way. He says that, that God who spoke Light, excuse me, who spoke light out of darkness has spoken into our hearts and shown us the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. That Jesus Christ is the outshining, the glory, the outshining of God. He is that lamp that holds that light. It's all about Christ. Even when you hear the word light, you ought to think about Christ. Christ. He is the light of the world. Amen. Hmm. What's interesting about light is that it, it doesn't discriminate. When light shines, it shines on all who can see it. The light of the sun, the physical sun, S-U-N, the light of the sun shines on the earth, and as the earth turns, all sides of it catch that light, and life prospers around the globe. And the light doesn't discriminate. There are shadows. There are places that maybe the light doesn't touch because they're underground or hidden. But the light shines over the whole earth. Even when it's storming and there's clouds overhead, it has not ceased shining. That's a matter of perspective. Some of you will get it later. Maybe you have a storm going on in your life. I want to encourage you that the sun is still shining, but you need to bring your perspective above those clouds in order to see it. The light shines without discrimination. It gives light to all those that are in the room. Jesus shares this with his disciples and even goes so far as to tell them that their nature is not too different from his own. He says in Matthew chapter 5 that you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Interesting. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Just as the wise men saw the star and were overjoyed, they went in and saw the child and bowed down and worshiped him. It ought to be the same way in the church. When they see the light of God in your life, then they see the light of Christ in your walk, in your deeds, in your talk, in all that you are. When they see the light of Christ, they ought to come into the house and Fall down and bow down and worship Jesus Christ. Not you. Not your light. But him who gave it to you. They, they'll see your good deeds and praise your father. Hmm. Are you letting your light shine? Are you letting your light shine? Do people see Christ in you? That's the question. That's the challenge this week. Is there someone who's dwelling in darkness that you know about? Is there someone stumbling around that needs to see the light of Christ, that needs some light 
shed on the subject? Or are you letting your light shine? You guys remember that song? My daughter knows that song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Give it that little Frank Sinatra flair to it, right? Right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it sh- yeah, you got it. You know it. Yes. Are you letting your light shine? That's what this time of year is about. When you look around and you see the lights on people's houses, when you see the lights on trees in the store, wherever you're at, when you see those lights, know that those lights are testifying of Jesus Christ. And we ought to be the same. That we ought to be shining the light of Jesus Christ wherever we go, that people might see us. That this house ought to be decorated with the light of Christ just as we decorate our homes. Are you shining your light? Do people see Christ in you? What's interesting about the light that comes from the sun and the light that reflects off the moon is this idea of those two, those two lights that are talked about in Scripture on the earth, what people see. And we know, uh, speaking scientifically and with astronomy and those kinds of things, that the, that the sun is a source of light, that the sun is burning fuel and shining its light on the earth, and it's, it's fueling the earth with life and heat and warmth, and that the plants and the trees are using that light to produce oxygen, that we might have life. And then at night, there is the moon. The moon reflects the light of the sun. The moon has no light of its own. The moon, apart from the sun, is just a dead piece of dust. My friends, we are not so different. Without the light of Christ in your life, you are just a dead piece of dust. From the dust you came to the dust you shall return. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you have the light of Christ in your life? Without him, you're nothing. Without him, you are nothing. Without Christ, there's no Christmas. The Bible says without Christ, there is no life because all the life of the light of men is in him. It's found in him that he is the source of light and life. Do you know Jesus Christ today? Do you know Jesus Christ today? Will you stand with me for prayer this morning? Father God, I thank you for your light. I thank you for your life that you have given so freely in your son, Jesus Christ. Father God, right now, I want want you to encourage your people. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move us that we would be preaching the gospel, that we would be feeding the hungry, that we would be taking care of the poor, the widow, and the orphan. Cause us to walk in your light, to do your works in this world, that others may see the light of Christ. Without you, we are nothing, Jesus. I pray that your spirit come now, fill us, guide us, move us, give us light. I pray, Father, if everyone under the sound of my voice, that when they see a light and when they think about a light, that they would think about Jesus Christ, that they would be reminded of the light that you gave to us, the light that is still shining in the church. Lord, I pray, cause us to shine. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Has God given you some light this morning? Something that you want to share? I want to challenge you. Go home, find the darkest room in your house. Find the most important thing that you have to do in your house. Bring it in there. Shut the lights off. Close the door to where it's completely dark and try to get it done. (laughs) 
It seems silly, right? We have a very important work that needs to be done in this, in this area, in Ark City, in Cali County. People need to know about Jesus. There are too many people running around with no light, trying to do it in the dark. You need to be looking to Jesus Christ. Look to him first. Let him guide you in the work that he wants you to do in this town. There's something for everybody to be doing. You could be blessing someone today, tomorrow when you go to work, when you go to school. God has something for you. I ask that you would challenge yourself. Pray, seek God's wisdom and light in this. If you need to make a decision this morning, if you need to make a confession this morning, if you need to get baptized this morning, you've never been baptized, I want to invite you to come as we sing this morning about Christ being the light, about Jesus being the light of the world. The invitation is open. If you need to do something, you need to share something with the congregation, I want to invite you this morning to come as we sing. Jesus Christ is the light. Never forget that. If you need to come, come as we sing.